Katrina, and good evening, everyone. So this event is part of our Understanding the Decade of Commemorations project. It's been delivered in partnership with the Nerve Centre and the Tower Museum, and we're supported by the Peace Four programme, and it's managed by SEUPB. It's always a bit of a mouthful to get the grant people in. It's also match funded by the Executive Office in Northern Ireland and the Department of Rural and Community Development. Many of you will know the Tower Museum has been closed for most of 2020 and we're, we're closed at the moment. Our Dividing Island exhibition was looking at partition and looking at the development, the origins, the legacy of partition. It went up on display in around May, June time. So some of you did get in. We had quite a, when we were open for a few, uh, few months in the summertime, we were very, very busy. What we've done as we've been closed is we have had the Nerve Centre in with us this week and we are videoing all of the exhibition. So it will go up online shortly. So do check out our tellermuseumcollections.com website. There's a lot of content. We've got lots of the objects and archives already up there. And all of the programs of engagement we've done since, uh, since we started. We had a, a lovely conversation event with Dermot Ferreter and, and Garrett Carr. That's available. And there's lots of other short videos which gives you an insight into Dividing Island. So tonight's event is about archives. I'm the archivist in the Tower Museum and my responsibilities are the archives and the art collections. And what we like to do is to ensure that they are made accessible many different ways to as many people as possible. So an event like this has been hugely popular. So we're, we're really delighted. It, the collection we have, our most significant items for this period really link to the to London Dairy Corporation. We have minute volumes and letter books and these give a, a fascinating insight into the political, social and cultural history of that day. If any of you have had a chance to look at Minute Books online or, or with us in the Tower Museum, you can see how fascinating they are and they really do give you an insight as to what is going on. These ones for this particular period, 19, 1912 to 1925, include references to the, the turbulent year of 1920 when the elections in the city returned a, a nationalist majority for the very first time and subsequently our very first Catholic mayor. They also have quite extensive correspondence between the town clerk of the day and Michael Collins, and they discussed a lot on partition and the potential and eventual installation of the Northern Ireland state as we know it today. So some of those items are on display and will be online um, for you to have a look at in the not so distant future. I think what we're trying to stress tonight is how important archives are. Archives help us understand history and what they do. History is something that we need to know about and it's something that we can learn from and acknowledge in all of its complexities. And that's really what archives do. They help you really understand what is going on. They come from lots of different backgrounds and lots of different communities. So we encourage people to access the collections as much as possible. I'll give a quick plug to our next event, which is the Divided Island, Dividing Island Conference in February. So that's two, over two days, the 17th and 19th of February, where we have a really excellent two panels of academics, which has been put together by Dr. Adrian Grant from the University of Ulster. I thank you all, and I'm delighted to see all my colleagues here this evening. And I'm gonna pass straight back to Katrina Crow, the chair of tonight's panel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bernadette, and I recommend that all of you uh, get a look at the website, and especially when the exhibition goes online and you'll be able to, to see it more thoroughly than we can now. So our purpose tonight is to explore the important role played by archives in understanding the events leading to, to the creation of the state of Northern Ireland. The decade of centenaries upon which we embarked in 2012 is capable of all kinds of uses, abuses, interpretations, misinterpretations, illuminations, mischiefs, sublime new understandings, and ancient bad tempers. Uh, and all of these have been in play over the last nine years, but in balance, we've had more sublime new understandings than ancient bad tempers. So let's remind ourselves briefly about what happened uh, during these years. On our small island on the edge of a very powerful continent and next door to a large imperial power, we embarked in 1912 on a decade of diverse thought processes, activities and interactions, often diametrically opposed to each other, 
which resulted in outcomes as varied as the establishment of a modern version of unionism in the northern part of the country, the birth of a modern trade union movement, mass participation in the most murderous war then yet seen in the world, the achievement of the franchise for some women, the creation of founding myths for two states, the elimination of the political party which had enjoyed overwhelming nationalist support for three decades, the creation of a new nationalist party whose roots spread in many different directions, the partition of the island into two separate states, a vicious civil war, and most importantly, the deaths of around 40,000 people and injuries often seriously disabling to many more. So there's a lot of stuff to deal with. The delivery of public history in a way that would engage interest and enlighten people was to be crucial with how we dealt with all of this. And crucial to that endeavor has been the extraordinary volume of new archival sources which have informed our understanding of these complicated events. The complicated event we are discussing tonight is the creation of the Northern Ireland state following the partition of the island. This year will mark the centenary of the establishment of that state and we can expect many diverse views and analyses of this landmark event. Tonight, we have three distinguished archivists to talk about sources broadly relating to the origins, ideology, and practical arrangements for the creation of that state. Broadly, I say, because uh, they are having a reasonable leeway uh, to move among the sources that they think are important. Michael Keane is an archivist at the Military Service Pensions Project attached to the Military Archives in Dublin. He regularly engages in outreach and educational activities on behalf of that project. Elizabeth McAvoy is an archivist at the National Archives of Ireland with special responsibility for education and outreach. Stephen Scarth is head of public services at the Public Record Office of Northern Ireland and responsible for their customer service and outreach, among many other responsibilities. So these are three outward facing archivists um, involved in education and outreach in, in all three cases. Uh, and of course, those activities per force at the moment deal with the preservation, dissemination, and illumination of the archives of which they are stewards, which relate to the decade of centenaries. Each of them will talk for around 10 minutes, and then we'll open the discussion up to the audience. And I would ask you to uh, restrain yourselves in terms of the chat, um, because it may distract the speakers if something that isn't relevant to what they're talking about appears on the screen. We will have plenty of time for questions and answers at the end. So hold back until then. Uh, unless there's something desperately urgent that you need to tell uh, all of us here. So they're going to speak in alphabetical order. There is no hierarchy here. Um, and I'm going to call on Michael uh, to speak first. Michael, over to you. Michael? Michael, have you frozen? Paula, can you help? Michael. Okay, Michael, unmute yourself, you're on. I think Michael might be having some internet. I think he is, alas. This is the problem of virtual reality. I would, would either Elizabeth or Stephen be prepared? Yeah. Uh, Elizabeth, would you be prepared to step in here? And we'll hope that Michael can restore his Wi Fi. Michael, are you back with us? Can you hear me? We can. We lost you there for a fair oh. length of time. Okay. So start again. Thanks, Elizabeth, for being willing to step in. Okay, Michael, fire Sorry. ahead. Sorry. Apologies for that. No. Uh, so tonight I'm just going to speak to you briefly about the Military Service Pensions Collection and just make some general observations regarding material in the collection relating to Northern Ireland. Uh, due to obvious time constraints, I'm not going to go into any great detail regarding specific events and individuals, but I will happily try and answer any questions any of you might have later on. So the Military Service Pensions Collection is an archive collection which has gradually been made available online via the Military Archives website, militaryarchives.ie, and work on this collection is ongoing. The collection itself relates to applications for pensions and medals in respect of service claim between 1916 and 1923, also applications for allowances and gratuities in respect of wounds, injuries, disease, disabilities, 
claimed to have been incurred as a result of service at that time. And finally, applications from dependents and relatives of those whose debts at that time or later were claimed to have been due to their service or, or activities during the period. And the organisations concerned here, we're talking about the Irish Volunteers, IRA, Citizen Army, Common Naman, Hibernian Rifles, Fine Aaron and Oglina Heron. Other file series of interest in the collection are the nominal roles or membership listings for the IRA, Common Naman and the Fine Aaron and the IRA Brigade activity files, which provide details of activities, operations and attacks carried out by the IRA, and generally also include the names of the participants. Both of these last file series were created in the 90s and 1930s and 1940s to assist the workings of the Referee and Advisory Committee, which were overseeing the administration of the 1934 Military Service Pensions Act. In both cases, the documentation and information were provided by committees formed from veterans of the organisations in question at local level throughout the island of Ireland and also in uh, Scotland and England as well in some cases. For various reasons, uh, neither of these series can unfortunately be considered as 100% comprehensive and there are substantial gaps, particularly in the nominal roles for Common Amon and the Fianna Aaron. While the level of quality, while the level and quality, sorry, of information contained in the IRA Brigade activity files, just uh, in terms of what you can expect to find on those files, the most important thing, obviously, is the uh, testimony of the individual applicants themselves as to the details of their service. So, for example, the organisations and the units within those organisations that they belong to, who their commanding or superior officers were, and the activities or attacks and operations that they claim to have taken part in, and so on. Generally, on the files, you will also find testimony from former comrades and superior officers supporting, or in some cases not, uh, the applicants' claims as well. And the other important thing about this is that the information relating to these applicants is not just confined to the 1623 period. Files, particularly for successful pension applications, but also for others, generally follow them for the rest of their lives, and even in many cases provide uh, details regarding surviving widows or widowers in many cases as well. So as a result, there's also uh, quite a bit of additional socio-economic information on the files. For example, you can see who immigrated and where to, who stayed behind in Northern Ireland, for example. And then again, for those who moved south, who ended up holding positions in the Irish Defence Forces or Garda Shia Corner. Another important thing to note about the collection, and not just about in terms of Northern Ireland, but the entire collection, is that the role it has played in highlighting the crucial part played by women during the period and not just in common among the women's organization. So, for example, you have a number of women who are involved either as actual members of the IRA or working very, very closely with that organization. So, for example, somebody like Annie McGuire from County Down, who ended up as director of communications for four Northern Division IRA, or somebody like Roisin Murray, uh, formerly known as Roisin Doherty from Derry, of whom Padre O'Donnell, one of the senior officers in the Derry Donegal area, said that she was as good as any IRA brigade staff officer and did the work of one. We have found the odd previously unknown or perhaps surprising bit of information relating to Northern Ireland, such as a, a major operation which the IRA planned to carry out in Belfast in late December 1920, or possibly early January 1921, that appears to have been foiled or called off following the intervention of local Catholic clergy. The presence also of an admittedly very, very small number of Protestants in the ranks of the Belfast Irish Volunteers and IRA, and finally, the IRA company commander in County Armagh, who appears to have joined the RUC at some point in his later life. In general, however, the material on the files shows that the nature of the Irish Volunteers and IRA campaign in Northern Ireland during the War of Independence period was very similar to elsewhere on the island. Events and experiences, of course, diverged after that, particularly once the Civil War broke out in the South. However, in that case, the, the material that has already come to light in the collection makes clear, as was already known to some extent, both that considerable numbers from Northern Ireland took part on both sides of the Civil War, and that the Civil War also had a major impact on the IRA in Northern Ireland. It's interesting to note as well that it's very clear from the files that applicants from Northern Ireland felt both that their, their situation during the period 1916 to 1923 and after was very different from that experience uh, by veterans of the various organisations on the rest of the island. 
And it's also clear that they felt that these differences were not understood or fully comprehended either by their comrades in the South or by the pension authorities in the Free State and the Republic. Now, obviously, the most important difference that they are keen to point out is both the size and the strength of the opposition they faced, mainly, of course, from the unionist and loyalist population. But they also point out, uh, in many cases and many files, that they also had to face opposition from within their own Catholic nationalist community, namely from members of the Ancient Order of Hibernians and the Irish Parliamentary Party. Northern applicants are also keen to point out in the files, particularly in any case those from Derry and Belfast, that Southern veterans never had to face the kind of intense and prolonged period of violence that they had had to face in Derry in June of 1920 and in Belfast on a number of occasions between 1920 and 1922. Northern veterans were also keen to point out that for them there was no truce period. So for example, whereas in the South, the period between the end of the War of Independence on the 11th of July 21 and the outbreak of the Civil War on 28th of June 22 was relatively peaceful. In Belfast, for example, uh, immediately after the truce, uh, the declaration of the truce, violence actually intensified. And similarly, the first six months of 1922 saw varying degrees of violence across Northern Ireland, both before and during what's often referred to as the Northern Offensive. And as well as that, Northern applicants felt aggrieved that the manner in which the service pension legislation had been framed failed to recognise that for them, that very period, the truce period, as it was called in the South, was both their most active and the most violent period for them in terms of service and that this lack of recognition cost them dearly when it came to actually receiving service pension awards. And finally, of course, and most obviously maybe in some ways, it's very clear that their situation, uh, the situation of veterans in Northern Ireland after the 2016 to 23 period was quite different from that ex of experience in that of the South. So, for example, whereas in the South, the, uh, the IRA veterans could quite easily hold their meetings to draw up listings of membership and activities and so on, and it was a completely unremarkable event. Brigade committees in Northern Ireland didn't have that freedom, and there are many reports in the files of these meetings being raided by the RUC, attendees arrested, and documents seized. And individual pension applicants themselves also complain on occasion that they're unable to get references from former IRA colleagues or officers because, of course, that person has been arrested or interned by the Northern authorities. So whereas, to some extent, no doubt, the uh, applicants from Northern Ireland had a point in terms of uh, how, how well their situation was recognised either by the former colleagues or the pension authorities, there is evidence in the collection that, to some extent, at least it was appreciated. So firstly, the first example of that is that for applications under the 34 Service Pensions Act were actually from Northern Ireland and were Northern Irish uh, IRA veterans. Seamus to evade the attentions and to uh, prevent Northern Irish authorities becoming too suspicious of their work. So for example, uh, Correspondence with applicants and brigade committees in Northern Ireland was carried out by via third parties and via covering addresses along the border. And likewise, when dependence claims from Northern Ireland were being investigated and applicant circumstances and means being looked into, agents of the Northern Ireland state were bypassed, unlike the situation in Scotland and England and Wales, for example. And in Northern Ireland, representatives of St Vincent de Paul, Catholic clergy and other private individuals deemed trustworthy were asked to do the needful. So that's, I think that's all the time I have for the present. But as I said before, any questions that anybody has regarding the collection or its contents, I'd be very happy to, to answer. And just to say, there's lots of information regarding the collection on the Military Archives website. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. That was exemplary timekeeping. Absolutely perfect, 10 minutes. Um, I often think when, when as, as the amazing treasure trove that is the Military Service Pensions Files is explored, there's going to be a massive history of disappointment emerging out of it because of all the people who didn't get pensions, uh, as opposed to the small number who did. We're now moving on to Elizabeth McAvoy, as I said, an archivist and a former colleague of mine in the National Archives of Ireland. Elizabeth, where you go. Thank you very much, Katrina, uh, for the introduction. Ditto to Paula, Bernadette and the Tower Museum team for the very kind invitation uh, to me to speak at tonight's seminar and good evening, everybody. 
Um, the title of this evening's event and the origin, impact and legacy of partition are quite broad themes. So given the time allocated to my talk, I will be focusing on certain record series held in the National Archives. I am now just going to switch over to a PowerPoint presentation and hoping that everybody can see that okay. Yep, that's perfect, Elizabeth. That's great. Thank you very much for confirming that, Paula. Um, okay. Just a brief presentation outline there where I will be talking about records uh, held in the National Archives, which were created either as a direct result of the partitioning of the island or which document the consequences of or life after partition. <clears throat> if time permits, I'll also mention briefly those collections that were deliberately split after partition and sent by their record creators in Dublin to the newly established Public Record Office and Public Record Office of Northern Ireland, which opened its doors in Belfast in 1924. But first, some context on the Government of Ireland Act, whose implementation began on the 3rd of May 1921 and which effectively divided the island into two separate self-governing entities, Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland. It's worth bearing in mind, however, that while in 1920 to 21, the concept of partition was not a novel one, it was very few people's ideal solution for the future of the island. In fact, as late as 1916, the Abbey Theatre staged a play entitled Partition, a political skit, a comedy that parodied the idea of a border on the island as a preposterous and comical fantasy. However, by 1920 to 21, it became clear that unionist and nationalist aspirations were moving in very different directions. And the Government of Ireland Act was to crystallize those divisions without actually intending to do so. It envisaged the creation of two autonomous regions within the United Kingdom and not two separate states on the island of Ireland. Doyle Aaron refused to recognize the partitioning of the island or the institutions created under the 1920 Act. And for many people north and south of the island, much of its content was already obsolete, even as it entered the statute books, because it completely ignored the dramatic events that had taken place in Ireland, especially in the two preceding years. Doyle Aaron's attitude to partition and its attempts to undermine the 1920 Act are clearly reflected in some of the records which form part of the DE2 or Doyle Aaron series and also in the Northeastern Boundary Bureau collection. I'll be referring that to that as the NEB for short. And looking firstly at the content of the Doyle Aaron 2 series, it consists of correspondence between the Secretary to Doyle Aaron and the Cabinet and members of the Doyle. It contains documents generated by the administration established after the election of 1918 to, sub, uh, to support the government's activities. And it also uh, contains the incredibly important and precious papers relating to the treaty negotiations for the Anglo-Irish Treaty, which began in London uh, on the 11th of October and ran until the 6th of December 1921. The records in this series have been digitized and are available to search and view on the website of the Digital Repository of Ireland. The oppositional stance taken by the Doyle towards partition and sectarian violence in the new state of Northern Ireland can be seen in some of the file titles alone in the DE2 series. For example, Propaganda Against Partition, Persecution in Northern Ireland, Atrocities Against Catholics in Belfast, it's also worth mentioning that propaganda efforts and the Belfast boycott feature intermittently in the records or the cabinet minutes of Doyle Aaron. And when they do, they rather pointedly appear under the departmental heading of home affairs. And now for the second collection I've chosen, which is also held in the National Archives and which was also created as a direct result of the partitioning of the island, the Northeastern Boundary Bureau established in 1922 to prepare the Irish Free State submission on partition and the boundary to the Boundary Commission, which began its deliberations in London in 1924. The Boundary Commission's existence was provided for under Article 12 of the Anglo-Irish Treaty, 
to determine the exact delineation of the border in the event of Northern Ireland refusing to join the Irish Free State. So this is Article 12, providing for the establishment of the Boundary Commission. A, the State of Northern Ireland confirmed on the 8th of December 1922, it opted to remain within the United Kingdom under the terms of the 1920 Act. Now, the NEB's functions were threefold. They were there to collect and compile data for submission to the Boundary Commission hearings, collect information on Northern Ireland and act as a channel of communication between the Irish Free State Government and the nationalist population in Northern Ireland, and to conduct a publicity campaign to inform public opinion as to the true implications of Article 12 of the Treaty. And these functions generated the following records series. So NEB 1, the Secretariat, 2, Research, 3, Publications and Propaganda, and number four, the Boundary Commission. While the collection has not yet been digitized, it has been fully listed and its finding aid can be searched in the online catalog on our website. As regards records held in the National Archives that document the consequences of our life after partition, these include the records of the president, president of the Executive Council, which was renamed the Department of the Taoiseach in the Constitution of 1937, Bonrock Heron. Also, the records from the Department of External Affairs, nowadays the Department of Foreign Affairs, and the Department of Justice. The Department of the Taoiseach's early central registry files are particularly rich here because they include files on how border crossing, trade and traffic was managed, the illegal crossing of the border by armed and police forces, and the relationship between the Irish government and the government and people of Northern Ireland. What's interesting about these files is how the language that's used in their title speaks volumes about how the government administration in Dublin regarded partition. For example, a file entitled Social and Cultural and Economic Cooperation between the 26 and six counties. There are other files on the exact use of the term six counties. And again, these reflect the mindset of officialdom in the Irish Free State and what they seem to regard almost as a temporary division of the island. Before the Boundary Commission's report was deliberately buried in 1925, hopes had been high in the Irish Free State that the counties of Fermanagh and Tyrone would be transferred to the 26 counties. And it's an indication of just how the Commission's conclusions pleased no one that its report was not published until 1969. Files on security and breaching of the border, cattle crossing, people ending up accidentally on the other side of the border are also commonly found in the records of the Departments of Justice and External Affairs. And finally, the division of collections and their transfer to Prony. Those administrative records relating to the geographic entity that was Ireland were separated after partition and transferred to the new Public Record Office of Northern Ireland. Little could be transferred from the Public Record Office in the Four Courts complex, due, of course, to the catastrophic fire and explosion in June 1922 during the early months of the Civil War. However, some of the main record series relating to the counties of Northern Ireland that went north were transferred directly from their office or institution of creation to Prony. And these include spatial records often organized on a county by county basis, which made the task of splitting them somewhat easier. So, for example, the type plotment books relating to the six counties of Northern Ireland were transferred north by the Land Commission directly. Ditto maps, plans, valuations from the Valuation Office and from the Ordnance Survey were also sent north. Equally, other collections arranged or organised geographically, such as the census returns of 1901 and 1911, plus the census search forms, Crown and Peace records and some education records were retained in the Public Record Office of Northern Ireland, or sorry, the Public Record Office of Ireland, now the National Archives. The story of the splitting and transfer of public records from south to north is a fascinating saga which deserves an entire lecture of its own. But for now, I'd just like to thank you all for your attention.
Elizabeth, another exemplary timekeeper. Stephen, you've got a hard act to follow here. These people yeah. time themselves at the hill. Fascinating yeah. uh, paper. The Boundary Commission material is obviously something a lot of people are going to take a huge interest in, and it's very good that they've been catalogued and can be made available. Stephen, you're up next. Stephen Scarth of Public Records Office of Northern Ireland. Go ahead. Thank you, Kitchener. I think we need to recognize this. This is a very different conversation that would have taken place um, 12 months ago had there not been COVID. And very much one of the casualties of the pandemic is that both researchers and staff and um, the public even uh, have all been restricted in what access they, they're getting to the records. Um, so I am going to make my talk focus more on the lessons that have arisen from marking centenaries since 2011 particularly centenaries in Northern Ireland. Back in 2011, um, I would say that I was both optimistic and apprehensive. However, there were very promising signs when our Minister of the then Departmental of Culture, Arts and Leisure, Carolyn Cullen, and her counterpart in the Republic, Jimmy Dinahan, um, I just about remember Jimmy's name, held an event at the Ulster Hall. and. Um, where a copy of the proclamation was exhibited side by side with a page from the Ulster Covenant for the first time ever. Now, I was the one who selected the page from the Ulster Covenant because Ulster Covenant is one of Crony's archives. And I chose one which featured Fred Crawford allegedly signing the Covenant in blood. And I'll talk about that later. However, that was the last event that there was a joint approach by government. Um, which is in contrast to what happened in England and ROI, where the governments were very much in the lead. So for the remainder of the centenaries, the lead was taken mostly by various public bodies or by the Northern Ireland office and the First World War Committee led by Geoffrey Donaldson, and that um, concentrated specifically on commemorations, i.e. the start of the First World War, the Somme, the Battle of Jutland, the end of the war, those very specific events. Um, so I want to talk about three areas. One, the use of language, recognizing there are different perceptions and indeed narratives, and then finally finding opportunities in our events, our catalogs, our acquisitions to enjoy sure different voices are heard. So use of language, and Elizabeth has kind of touched on this. Terminology is important, more so in Northern Ireland than most places. Even the name of the country proves problematic. Um, depending on your politics, you may refer to it as Northern Ireland. Um, some may refer to Ulster, despite the fact only six counties of the nine county Ulster are there. Um, if you listen to the BBC in the 1970s, they talked about the province. Don't know if anybody remembers that. Um, and more recently, um, what has crept in is the north of Ireland. Um, which is a very familiar usage, particularly by modern day nationalists. The, um, when it, if we look at different perceptions and narratives, um, one of the things Prony and other Northern Ireland public bodies signed up to in 2011 was a set of principles for marking centenaries, which was developed by the Community Relations Council. That is on their website. And if anybody wants, I can give you that link later. And there are four principles of note in that, um, in those principles. And the first was start from the historical facts. Seems obvious, doesn't it? Um, but when you actually dig deep, um, Prony put the Ulster Covenant online. It's digitized, digital, digitized and available. And um, fairly quickly, we uncovered lots of myths about the Covenant. One, Fred Crawford claimed he signed the Covenant in blood. Um, we put him to the test and got some scientists from Queen's University to come out, um, take a small sample from the writing, conduct tests, and after an hour and a half, he declared he was 100% certain it was red ink. He backtracked and then said it was 90% red ink, and we had a the leader of the, a future leader of the Austrian Unionist Party in the audience that day called Robin Swan, and he said 10% was good enough for him. The another myth was that um, no Catholic had signed the Ulster Covenant. Um, being mythbusters, we we just we broke this myth down and destroyed it in its entirety. Using the um, census, which um, the 1901-1911 census, we were able to identify um, a, a a family in Portadown um, who are 
uh, who had signed the covenant put their address and the same entry in the covenant and said Roman Catholic. So we were able to myth bust that. Um, the, we also found somebody who signed the Ulster Covenant in Irish, um, perfect Irish, old Irish, um, almost certainly a Presbyterian um, called Robert Murray. Um, the fact that he also falsified his address um, is equally a mystery. Um, he gave his address as 41 Falls Water Street. When we looked at the street directories, there was no such address as 41 Falls Water Street. It stopped at number 30. And then I suppose the biggest myth of them all was that the Ulster Volunteer Force seamlessly morphed into the 36th Division and went off and all died um, on the battles of the Somme in 1916. I have a lot of research on recruitment and the identities of people who signed up to disprove this narrative. Uh, many UDF members were too old or too young, where in some cases they were actually required to work the farms in Ireland. So probably only about 50% of that membership ever went. Um, recognize implications and consequences of what happens. It's easy to compartmentalize different elements of Irish history, break them down, segment them, and make them just parts rather than um, joined up. Um, but realistically, and so we break down things like the Home Rule Crisis, the Battle of the Somme, Easter Rising, War of Independence, Partition. However, these didn't end up happen independent of one another. These these, these, these cascaded upon one another. You know, one happened because of the other. Ulster Unionists enlisted in the Great War in response to Edward Carson's appeal to save the Union. Meanwhile, Nationalists joined the 16th Division in response to James John Redmond's appeal to fight for home rule. In the hospital where James Connolly lies dying in the aftermath of the Easter Rising, in the adjacent wards, um, the, the injured from the First World War are also set, almost side by side. And then we need to understand that different perceptions, interpretations exist. There, there is no one narrative that owns history. One person's blood sacrifice can be interpreted by another as an act of terrorism. So we need to share the space. And so during the last 10 years, Pruny tried to ensure that all perspectives were included. Um, we did an exhibition of First World War. We also did one on Cartus Markovis and her sister Eva Gord Booth, whose papers Pruny also has. Okay, and I'm going to try and finish off just so we know on um, point finding opportunities in our events catalogs and acquisitions to ensure voices of each traditions are heard pony was created 100 years ago nearly 100 years ago after the destruction of the public record office of ireland and many of the records that were collected were those of the state nationalists took an abstentionist approach to northern Ireland parliament up until its collapse in the 70s which has resulted in a number of gaps within the collections. And thankfully, that's kind of balanced by um, other institutions in Ireland. But that being said, organizations like Prony and like other institutions in Ireland, we still have that proactive choice, what we choose to catalog. Uh, many of our collections, you know, we don't include the voice. Many of our collections include voices from women, and we have actively chosen not to catalog those. Um, and I mentioned the papers of um, Countess Markovitz uh, there earlier, and that is part of the Lizardale connection. And it was interesting that all the men um, were catalogued in that connection until only about three or four years ago, at which point Countess Markovitz and her hitherto unknown sister, Eva Gorbruth, a legend in her own right, um, we, we actually catalogued themselves. So what I'm saying is, you know, we, we can't, we, we, we don't have to accept the status quo. We can be a bit more vigilante at I don't think these things happen. Thank you. Thanks very much, Stephen. Um, it's it's very it's always interesting to listen to you talk because you're essentially making a plea for imagination that each side understand the other side in some kind of way and that we share the space uh, for what I prefer to call reflection and interrogation rather than commemoration. That we're looking back at at very complicated events that happened with. Uh, often very differing perspectives. Thank you for that. We're another exemplary timekeeper. You're all so good. I am deeply impressed. This is what archivists are like. They just stick to their, their last and do what they're meant to. So we have 20 minutes for engagement from the audience, and I'm throwing it open to you now. Uh, 
Anybody out there? Ah, uh, here we go. Carl, access to records and observation for Tony. Can you see that, Stephen? What, what's being asked there? Um, okay, from Carl? From Carl, yeah. Okay, access to records and observation from Tony. Many online records are behind a paywall. No, Tony doesn't have a paywall um, ourselves. Anything that we make available is is free to search. So um, anything that Prony has put up ourselves is certainly free to search. Um, other institutions, obviously, like Ancestry and Family Past, do charge. But um, the collections Prony has are, I mean, those to Covenant, free to search, street directories, free to search, um, the Ordnance Survey maps, all free to search. Um, as are most Irish archives, I should say, compared to some of our British counterparts. If, let me put a, a plug. Does that answer that question? I think that does. We have a few more questions here. This is wonderful to see people responding so well. So from Jennifer, we have, are the official documents supplemented by private letters, etc.? Uh, perhaps... That's for Elizabeth and Stephen in terms of, of uh, the national, the two national institutions. Would you like to try that, uh, Elizabeth? Um, yeah, sure. I'm just scrolling through. Um, so, Katrina, could you repeat the question there, please? Um, are, are the official documents supplemented by private letters, etc.? I mean, you may be looking at, at institutions like the National Library, which obviously have some of the great literary and political collections. The UCD Archives Department. Um, we would not have certainly to these to the same extent uh, as the as the National Library in terms of their magnificent collection of of personal papers, letters from nineteen sixteen, and so on. So no, we we do have the records and um, cer certain private collections of individuals, but in terms of the the big names, like for example, Stephen has mentioned with Eva and Constance Gorbuth and the wonderful collections in UCD of individuals who participated. A, in the events that we're speaking about and uh, Michael has outlined earlier. So no, not generally. They don't tend to be complemented by much in the line of, of, uh, of private letters. Okay, thank you for that. And uh, Michael, for you, a question from Kieran Glennon. Uh, you mentioned the relative lack of nominal roles relating to Common Amon and Nathena in the military yeah. service pensions collection. Was that a particularly Northern thing or was it more widespread? And do you have a view why that was the case? It's a more widespread thing. It's not just a northern thing at all. Um, why did it happen? In general, with these things, you find that it's because um, people from that area who were involved in the organisations originally between 16 and 23, they're not there anymore. That's generally what's happened. Um, there's also, on occasion, and you get this as well with the IRA records as well too, local people or people who are involved locally just for whatever reason can't be bothered. Some of them are disillusioned um, either by what had happened during the period or by the whole process of trying to get their pensions and, and what have you. And like you said about the, the collection is, is full of very, very disappointed people on occasion. Um, so no, it's, it's not a particularly northern thing and it is widespread and there's a number of diff different factors as to, as to why it happens. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, two questions from Paul O'Dwyer for Stephen. What did Stephen say about not cataloguing women? You must have gone off to make a cup of tea, Paul, and missed what he said, which is perfectly clear. And the other one, which is a horrible question, which is what is the Northern Ireland view on the 1926 census? Well, you know, you're you're, on. You know this. <laughs> you're this. Um, uh, 1926 census... Um, disappeared into history and when I say disappeared it really did disappear in that um, there is literally no record of what happened to it. I, I think the general consensus was that it went over to England to be um, to, to, to be indexed or unverified um, and then during the Second World War 
um, was a victim, as many other records were, you know, to the um, Luftwaffe, or indeed, more unpalpably, it possibly could have been pulped. But there are no actual um, indications within Prony's records from um, from from the from Nizer or the census that indicate actually what happened to it. it I mean, it never came to Prony. Um, and we're fairly confident it did go to England. Um, and that's where the trail ends, I'm afraid. But the obviously the big loss means that we don't have a 1921 census because it's, because of well what happened in Ireland. We don't have the 26 census for Northern Ireland. So really we're looking up to the 1939 register um, as the nearest thing that's um, possibly open. Um, so sorry about that, folks. Uh, I sympathise, but I think it's it's best to be open about it and let people know there isn't any hope for this. Uh, on the other hand, we, of course, in the National Archives, have the 1936 census for the rest of Ireland. Not that I'm gloating or anything like that. I, I sympathise deeply with, with something as big as that being lost. A question from Jimbo Boy. I am chairman of the A.E. Russell Society. I'd be very interested in anything relating to A.E. as he would have been very influential, especially in this period. Does anyone want to talk about it? I don't think it's really on the button for what we're discussing today. But maybe if uh, probably better to look to places like the National Library um, if the, I don't know where the Russell papers may be kept, but it's possible they're there. So that's the best we can do with that. Uh, a, rec a question from Shre Herne. Um, what records are available about police surveillance of trade unionists during the period? Anyone want to take that? They do exist, um, certainly in Prony, in, in the records of Home Affairs. Um, and it's pretty much all trade unionists, communists, anybody on the left kind of gets lumped in the same. And there was some overlap, though not a bit of overlap between, you know, the communist parties of Ireland, stroke communist party in Northern Ireland, and, you know, some of the nationalist parties. But I think generally they were quite distinct entities. Now that most of the home affairs files are open, and they actually, um, and this ties into a conversation earlier where somebody asked about private records versus official records. Pony is 50-50, private records and public mm -hmm. records. But this is an example where public records keeps an account um, of meetings held by the Knights of the Communist Party of Ireland, which were written down by the police, who had totally um, infiltrated the meetings and were taking very complex reports and very complete reports of um, who was there, what they were saying, if it was seditious. Um, so, yeah, the, that material does certainly does exist for the North and is mostly open. Great, that's, that's very encouraging. Margaret Ward, eminent historian, does Prony have records of Armagh Jail, particularly relating to Republican women prisoners in the 1920 to 24 period? Um, it's... Uh, HMP, yes, we have some. I'm not the expert. I'm not going to pretend to be an expert in, on prison records. I have other colleagues. Um, this is if you have a specific person in mind, um, if you write in and we can have a look and see what we have for that. But yeah, we do, we do, we certainly have them from the prison, all the prisons post partition. Okay, so possibly not. As early as, uh, not, certainly not as early as 1920, would that be true? I, I, I'm, I, I'm not uh, familiar enough with that collection, I, but I, other, others in, my, in the, our office can advise. Me. Okay, I think Margaret would be happy enough to, to communicate with you there. Okay, uh, from Dave M., where should one look for early documents by the provisional government, e.g. negotiations with the British Colonial Office regarding transfer of powers to the Irish Free State? Elizabeth, I think that's for you. <clears throat> um, well, actually, 
An awful lot really will be detailed uh, not only in the DE2 material, but also the early records of the Department of External Affairs, um, which celebrated its centenary in 2019. So quite a lot, certainly the, obviously the treaty itself lays forward, lays down a framework um, for the, the way in which the Irish Free State and obviously governing its relations with the new state of Northern Ireland, but certainly early Department of External Affairs material. Um, and also to take a look as the, the questioner asks about the colonial office material in London. Um, when the British departed the, their administrative offices in 21-22, they took an awful lot of their material with them, which they were perfectly entitled to do. Uh, but when that was brought over um, and found a home in the under colonial office material, quite a lot of that material was um, microfilmed. Uh, and there is the, you probably remember it yourself, Katrina, the CO904, a mm -hmm. microfilm series of colonial office material that was microfilmed in London, the originals microfilmed and given to the National Archives. A, in, in a sense, just to, I suppose, because material had been you know, taken in 21-22 uh, to give people an insight in Ireland to what was contained in the colonial office records without actually having to make the trip to, to London. Very convenient. As far as I remember, Elizabeth, in the dim reaches of my deteriorating memory, uh, we also have a set of records on provisional government. Uh, which is 22 to 24, I think. Um, the, file, the prefix I remember for the files is or. They're not particularly interesting, which may be why they haven't been, been foregrounded. But there is a set of, of actual files for the provisional government itself. Uh, question from Dave M. Did many civil servants from the Irish Free State move to Northern Ireland after partition or vice versa? Steve, here you go again. We have Martin McGuire's great book on the civil service after 1922, which is wonderful. Uh, the interesting question. Answer is yes. Um, um, and both, I think, probably, I mean, it, 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 it does reflect the, the, the big social chain move, you know, by people moving north. And then again, there was reflected going the other way as well. Certainly, Prony's first um, deputy keeper. Was probably the, one of the more famous folk who worked in the national, the public record office of Ireland, David Charn. He moved north um, to work for the Northern Ireland Civil Service, and he went north to work for the Northern Ireland Service, not to work for Prony. Um, Prony was then established um, after he'd moved north, and he was tasked to be the first deputy keeper. And he actually was, held that role with a number of other roles. That wasn't his only role uh, at the start, which isn't surprising given that you know, he had an office with no records when Prony was first set up. Um, so um, he's very much an example. Um, so they, they, they weren't all James Craig's mates, <laughs> as, as some in history might suggest. Yeah, there was a lot of movement back and forth in those years. And as I say, Martin McGuire's book about uh, changes in the Irish civil post 1922 is one of the best researched and written accounts of all of that. Fintan Monaghan is asking, my understanding from the historian Michael Hopkinson is that the British cabinet papers from 19 to 22, that's 1919 to 1922, are still not released. They were in fact locked up under the 100 year rule. How true is this? And if so, what is the National Archives doing about same? As uh, if this set of voices are vital to understanding what happened. I don't know the answer to that question, does anybody? I certainly haven't heard that before that the that the material was was locked up. Um, if Mr. Hopkinson is wondering in that in that situation what the National Archives is doing about it, from our perspective, absolutely nothing because obviously it would be a matter for uh, for the National Archives in in Q. All we can say is that our own records have been open from that period from. You know, time immemorial. Time immemorial. <laughs> yeah. So it's a great date, that time immemorial. <laughs> we don't know the answer to that, but uh, it's certainly worth checking out because yeah. if it's the case, it is indeed very serious. I, I would, I would be surprised. I have I'd to, be surprised too. Yeah. I have to say, uh, I, I seem to remember cabinet records being mentioned in Ronan Fanning's books and various other people's uh, uh, accounts of the time. Anyway. 
Uh, Alice Doyle, we still have a lot of questions and time is short. What are the biggest challenges outside of the technical ones of making this material available online? And how do you ensure these linkages get represented? And supplementary to that, she asks, are you doing any collecting around the 2021 centenary to add to the story? I suppose, Stephen, that's probably for you in terms of what Prony is doing? Uh, I mean, digitization, uh, uh, there's a few common, um, a few common assumptions made about digitization that all, all digitization is just a bit of scanning and then you put it online. Um, it couldn't be further from the case. Um, irrespective of the technical side, which is you know, science in itself, but which is very doable, um, you, you, pro you may need a platform to um, search for, for, for particular connections, which may, you know, if you want to set up a particularly disparate series, you might only want to, you know, it's software that only relates to that particular connection. Indexing is a mass, is a mass of what you call something. Um, all the metadata associated. Um, it's not actually the digitization that is that causes problems um, when it comes to digital projects. It's almost it's invariably with the project management um, and actually getting it right at the start of the project. Um, projects sort of go longer and longer if the if they've not really been formulated at the start um, from experience. What was the other half of the question? Are you doing any collecting around the 2021 centenary to add to the story and presumably to your collections? Prony um, would absolutely welcome material, particularly material that fills the gaps. And I mean, we Prony can't take private records, so a bit like the National Library. So we do actually, we, we do want to take that material and there's lots of stuff still in people's attics. And I, I, I think, um, I think there's probably a lack of appreciation, you know, just how big some of these gaps are. You know, certainly, certainly in northern nationalism is a is an area we we want to fill the gaps. I've already mentioned the role of women, you know, which is underrepresented, you know, um, and then you know, um, more diverse and groups um, who have also not played their parts. So yes, um, that is always a proactive request. Okay, so you're, Katrina, you're, I, I might just yours. add. Sorry, Katrina, I might just add as well. Um, like Prony, we we have a collecting policy as well, so we are collecting. So if there is material for the Derry and Straban region, when we were developing the Dividing Island exhibition, we did quite a few appeals. Um, and the Northwest public are very very generous, so we do get quite a lot of donations and loans. Um, so I think people can can us in mind as well. Thanks for that, Bernadette. And again, people should remember the institutions are there to collect important documents and in the case of museums, or artifacts as well that are relevant to the period. I think we're, near, we're nearly out of time, but there's one last question. I think there are plenty of other questions. I'm really sorry to those of you that cannot be accommodated here. It just proves the level of engagement we've had tonight, which is very gratifying. But one last question from Michael and Grace. Michael mentioned records in the military archives for some women in quite high positions in the organization. I'm just wondering, did they receive pensions commensurate with men in similar roles? Uh, yeah, good question. Um, the answer to that is yes and no. The problem women faced um, is that basically there were five, I don't want to go into too much detail on this, but there were five grades or levels of which pensions were awarded. And basically, with the sole exception of Bridget Lyons Thornton, um, none of them got above the second level. OK, um, so I would say in general, no, they weren't. They didn't get the recognition. And in fact, there are examples of uh, for example, was the famous one is Margaret Skinner, who had to wait for something like 15 years, I think, after her initial application, not for service pension, but in respect of her wounds, uh, to have her uh, service recognised because someone had decided the definition of soldier was a male one. There you go. Misogyny. <laughs> All kinds of other things which are part of the interrogation we have to have in this period. It's now eight o'clock. I, I wish we could go on for much longer. 
Uh, your questions have all been wonderful and engaging and challenging. Uh, and I would like you to, well, I can't ask you to clap and thank <laughs> our three wonderful speakers. So on your behalf, I want to thank Elizabeth McAvoy, Michael Keane, and Stephen Scarth for really interesting contributions to this slightly fraught discussion, which archivists are doing their best to make less fraught, more interesting, more complicated. Thank you all for your attention and good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.